Let's talk about ghosts. I don't mean like haunted house ghosts. I mean ghost guns. This is Alan with Quarter Horse Arms. And in this episode, I do want to talk about ghost guns, um, mostly because I became intrigued. Um, I was driving to work, and there were, there were a couple of commercials on the radio talking about one of the local TV stations doing an expose on the absolute flood of ghost guns um, in this country. I'm going, okay. I didn't know it was that big a problem, but, you know, let's find out. I looked at a transcript of the interview because I actually wasn't around to see the actual TV show. And they had interviewed a U.S. attorney for Eastern North Carolina. They interviewed somebody from the ATF. And the guy from North Car- Eastern North Carolina U.S. attorney was going, yeah, these 3D printed guns are bad. And I'm like, I thought we were talking about ghost guns. 3D printing a gun is making a ghost gun, but it's not the only way to make it. And the ATF rep is talking about everybody making machine guns. Clearly, they must be given their ammunition because given the, you know, the still relatively high price of ammo, machine guns are fun to shoot, but it gets pretty expensive blowing through a 30-round magazine in two seconds. All right, that being uh, neither here nor there, uh, let's talk about um, ghost guns first. I mean, fundamentally, a ghost gun is basically what, what's referred to now as a PMF, which is a privately made firearm. Um, with the exception of eight states, it's perfectly legal for you to make one. Prior to the ATF ruling on the ghost guns, and you could buy an 80 percenter, you could buy an 80 percenter pistol frame, you could buy an 80 percenter AR lower receiver or a pistol caliber AR lower receiver. And if you had some skill and, you know, usually a drill press and a jig, you could mill out the part of the receiver that needed to be finished, which was the pocket for the trigger group, the hammer, the spring, the selector, that kind of stuff. Everything else was already there, like the magazine well is already complete. Um, The threading for the buffer tube is there. And, you know, the little holes for the uh, pins that hold the upper and lower together are already milled out. So, again, you know, with a jig, an end end mill bit, and lots of time, you could manufacture your lower receiver or your pistol frame. If you were really skilled, you could do it with a hand drill. I haven't seen anyone do that, but I have heard about it being done. It might not look pretty on the inside, but, you know, it's perfectly functional. Now, 3D printing, yes, it is perfectly legal to 3D print a gun. You have to be careful about the material you use, but just like anything else, you can only 3D print the parts that don't need to be made out of metal. Will you need a barrel that's made out of steel? Yes. Will you need a uh, bolt or an extractor, or if it's a semi-automatic pistol, a slide? Um, There are some newer materials that might be able to stand up to it, but you're talking about metal because these, these are parts of a firearm that take a beating. So the slide, you know, slamming back and working... Metal's probably going to be what you want. Um, Upper receiver on an AR. Um, 3D printing versus, you know, plastic molding. The molding is probably going to be a lot stronger. And most of the materials for 3D printers are not suitable for firearms, meaning they tend to be brittle. Now, what I don't see happening is a criminal sitting down with a catalog and going, okay, I want to commit a crime in a month. So let me order all these parts. I'm going to have to learn how to mill something out. 
And then I'm going to have to watch some YouTube video so I can see how to insert the trigger group and, you know, the hammer and all that stuff. It doesn't strike me as a win-win situation. Why not just steal the gun? In fact, a lot of the guns that are recovered from crime scenes are, in fact, stolen. So... Anything new and exciting about ghost guns? Not really. I mean, these days they just have to be serialized and you get background checked. Now, that's if you do it that way. If you're particularly skilled, and I mean really skilled, you could theoretically take a lump of aluminum and mill it down into a lower receiver. And unless you have some high-speed, you know, fancy you know, five axis CNC machine, you're still looking at hours to take this lump of metal and turn it into a workable receiver. Again, I just don't see that happening. Where I see ghost guns coming from are things that people made and are getting stolen or somebody has one and sold it to somebody who was going to do bad things with it. What I don't see, and I imagine, I could be wrong, but I just don't see a criminal sitting down and working out and fitting all these things together, etc. Um, and as far as making machine guns, are they difficult? Not really. Um, we used a ghost gunner mill, um, my uh, friends with Gear Report and I are working on an M16 project, so we took a couple of lowers to compare a semi-automatic versus a full automatic. Um, so we used the mill to mill out the pocket for where the auto sear would go. And that didn't take very long, but to put the pinholes in, using calipers, a ruler blue ink, and a drill press. We drilled the holes, essentially using our Mark I eyeballs. And it worked fine. So it is not difficult. Um, so, at any rate, enough said about what a ghost gun is. Let's go on to the numbers, because I want to talk about this flood of guns being recovered in crimes that are or ghost guns being recovered in crimes in North Carolina in 2019 there were 400 ghost guns recovered from crime scenes that number had jumped to 900 in 2022 so you know about a 125 percent increase well you know it's a gro crime is a growth industry now in the United States in 2019, there were 7,500 ghost guns recovered in crimes and 20,000 in 2022. And I'm going, you know, 20,000 of anything is a big number. And so I decided to figure out what did those numbers actually mean? So I started out with, uh, let's figure out, I know 45 to 50,000 people a year are killed with firearms. Murders, accidental shooting, suicide, etc. So, I went to go look up actual numbers. So, you know, I wound up at the Brady uh, website. And I know what you're saying. You're going, Alan, how could you go there? Well, you know, the Brady gun site, yeah, do I agree with what they're saying? Not particularly. But the numbers are pretty good. They claim that 320 people a day are killed with uh, guns. No, excuse me. 320 a day are shot. And that includes wounds, um, deaths, whatever. And another place, I actually did go somewhere else, and it said about 300 to 315 a day. So the numbers are pretty darn close. So if I use Brady's number of 320 a day being shot, over the course of a year, that's about 118,000 people being shot in the United States. And of those 118,000, 
we're looking at um, 45 or 50,000 actually resulting in deaths. So, you know, it's still a pretty big number. So then I said, okay, well, you know, and I do suck at math. So if you catch me at something, by all means, let me know. Um, what it amounted to was with all the shootings, that 20,000 ghost guns is roughly 17% of all of the deaths or ghost guns were involved in 17% of, well, let me rephrase that. Using those numbers, it means that um, ghost guns constituted 17% of the firearms involved in shootings. Okay, that's still a pretty big number. But there's a couple of things that uh, come to mind. Number one, when you bring a gun to a crime, odds are it's not getting used. You still brought the gun to a crime or to a crime scene. And the gun could be recovered without actually having shot anybody. But I'll come to that in a second. So what I looked at was, um, and, I, and I thought back to a webinar I was on when the ATF issued its new ruling on the 80 percenters and the PMFs or privately made firearms. They said in the United States, they had about 400 ghost guns that they could not trace back to an owner. Now, 400 out of 20,000 is like 2%. Um, even with serial numbers, there is a huge problem tracing them back to the owner because maybe 30% of the guns, it might even be as high as 50%, um, were just, you know, given from family member to family member or friend to friend. And there was never any record of it. Um, so that doesn't include those. But 2% is, frankly, not a bad number. I mean, you got to think about this. The claim is you can make an AR for about 500 bucks, And you can. But if you're making the gun for yourself... Odds are you're tricking it out. You know, this is something you made. You're going to put in the components you want. It's probably going to be, you know, somewhere around 750 to 1000 Just And again, it depends on what you throw in it. So let's come back to the fact that stealing a gun is much better than having to buy, the, buy all the parts, manufacture it so you can go commit a crime. But no one's really talking about that. All right, so what I did mention before was I wasn't sure how many guns were brought to crimes, but nobody got shot. And I thought about this, and I said, you know, that's got to be a much higher number. So I just Googled it. Um, I probably have the number written down. Actually, I didn't have this one written down. This one I actually did have to look up. And right before I did this podcast, I was really kind of shocked. And the first statistic I found was firearms recovered from crime scenes um, last year, 2022. 1.3 million handguns were brought to, were, were recovered from crime scenes. Suddenly, that 20,000 ghost guns really doesn't look like such a big number. And I stuck with handguns for the simple reason that people using long guns in crimes or in murders is really, really, really a small number. I think we're talking, you know, less than 10%. It might even be 4 I think 4% might be a, a more solid number. It's tough to conceal a long gun. So if I look at that 20,000 versus the 1.3 million, we're looking at a percent and a half maybe. So 
I'm going to assume that some of the ghost guns